The fact that we are sharing a stage has more to do with the fact that sadly those who came with their lives during this era do not have voices. I found out about this conference through John, and it was through his effort that I was invited to attend and participate in this conference. Sometimes when the truth dies with those lives are unjustly taken, it's efforts like individuals like Paul and John Trimbach refuse to turn a blind eye to the truth. Even if it means marring and the egos and halos of yesterday's resistance fighters to bring their justice. Texts by main leadership, Leonard Peltier, and their supporters to demonize my family's efforts bringing my mother justice by grouping us in with the feds and calling us feds is like me calling every supporter of Leonard Peltier and member of gang murderers because they affiliate and associate themselves with convicted murderers. It's ridiculous. My mother's murder is not a matter of politics. It's a matter of a moral and ethical code, which many have seen to forgotten and ignored in their attempts to try to be right instead of doing the right thing. Over the next few days, you will hear recollections from all sides of the events that will be from the survivors, the perceived victors, the victims, living and deceased. Today, I will be the voice to my mother and others who did not survive this era so that their truths and legacy are not lost in the political rhetoric of historical injustices conveniently used to hide the truth for three decades. Wounded Me 73 wasn't just a catalyst that would kickstart a whole generation to embrace native resistance and activism. It was also a precursor to a whole series of events that would result in at least over a dozen murders and deaths and would skyrocket the organization of AIM into political activism martyrdom, uncontested for over 20 years. Because let's face it, folks, dead people don't talk. I'm here to tell you much to the, to the, much to the disappointment of those who conspired to keep my mother's murder a deep, dark secret that families and nations do. I'm here to share my mother's truth with you in a separate record script. My mother was well known for her advocacy for human and women's rights, and she was committed to gender of our native rights. And yes, a proud member of Though my mother did not die and wouldn't be like Ray Robinson and several others, her experiences and connections she made with several high profile AIM members like Dennis Banks, Russell Means, Leonard Crow Dog, Vernon and Clyde Dogford, and Leonard Peltier during the movie, that would eventually lead to her execution by members of the wrong group. In 1973, when my mother answered the call for me to travel to the movie, she explained to us that she had to go help those who could not help themselves against the injustices they were suffering. I recall feeling proud of my mother and having great admiration for her strength and commitment in helping to defend and protect those as much as she had done for us in our short life together. As fierce of an advocate for Native rights, so was she in being a mother. She had lived through injustice of her time and experienced racism, marginalization, oppression, and promised us that she would do everything in her power so that we would not suffer as she did. My mother was a proud member of AIM and spoke highly of the potential of the and referred to the group as her second family. During the 71 day siege, my mother made several trips out of the movie back to Boston to bring to supplies and check in on us. It was during this time as well that we now know that Ray Robinson was shot and left to bleed to death in a closet at a clinic. Witnessed, I might add, by the same people later who would have knowledge and involvement in my mother's murder. I know my mother would have had a big problem with Amy trying to justify Ray's murder as an argument that turned bad. As a result of her activities with Amy and wounding me, she became wanted by the FBI. And there were several warrants out for her arrest. During that time, my mother and father had an agreement that whoever had the means to best provide for the children would have custody. Custody. My mother realized that being on the run from the FBI with two kids in tow probably was the best scenario in protecting our welfare and gave the tempor temporary custody to my father and we moved to Canada. During this time, she spent some time in California and through witness accounts and conversation through phone calls and letters, we were able to piece my mother's activities and into a timeline, which you can actually find on the News from Indian Country website, where Paul Domain has an isolated video on a watch list. But I will make note of this new events here because they do have a connection to the experiences that I lived through in our discovery of the truth. In June of 1975, my mother attended the AIM Farmington Convention, 
where an unaccounted stuck a gun to her mouth and interrogated her for being an informant. In August of 1975, my mother crossed the border undetected into Canada and made her last visit with us. During this time, she shared her experiences of being interrogated and told us that she had been questioned by members of me and that they were calling her informant. My aunties at the time had begged her not to go back and she insisted saying that she had to go prove that she wasn't the person they were saying that she was. When she went to leave, she got down on her knees, looked me straight in the eye and said three things that I still carry with me today. Don't ever let anyone tell you they are better than you are. We are all created equal. Don't lie. Whatever you do, always speak the truth. And more hauntingly, look after your sister. You are the oldest, and I'm counting on you to look out for her. As she was leaving, she promised to call us at Christmas as she usually did. None of us imagined that it would be the last time that we would see her. Christmas 75 came and went, and we did not receive my mother's phone call, and my aunties and family began to fear the worst. It was a few months after Christmas that I started noticing phone calls in the middle of the night and behind closed doors. In early March of 1976, my father sat us down and gave us the worst news of our lives. He asked us if he wanted like to attend his funeral, to which we declined, of course, because no child wants to attend their dead mother's funeral. Initial reports of my mother had died of exposure did not sit well with my family. Knowing my mother's survival skills and how she was raised, and knowing what my mother had shared when she was home last, both being accused of being upset by family members, my aunties began to ask questions publicly. Bruce Ellison graciously volunteered to request a second autopsy on the family's behalf. Unaware that a few short covers the report, the FBI had to do the same thing. It was during the second autopsy that a bullet was discovered in the back of my mother's skull, and now we knew we were dealing with a murder and not an accidental death. The Mayakis flew down to South Dakota to attend my mother's second funeral. They were picked up at the airport by members of Maine, in a van littered with ammunition and gun all over the floors. As they made the two trips, two hour trip up to where they were waking my mother's body, they were continuing to ask questions about what my mother had shared with them when she was home last. And they seemed really interested in what the feds were telling them. Fearing the worst, they made a decision to speak in their Mi'kmaq language and agreed not to say anything to them because their suspicions were so high. When they arrived at the wake, they were, they were not permitted to go and stand next to their sister, and they left the funeral heartbroken with even more suspicions and no answers. The dynamic at that time must have been mind-boggling. Here you had the FBI on one side, who by all reports in Indian country were not to be trusted when we were akin to Satan. On the other side, you had me, who had been involved in the gun interrogation of a family member that were calling your sister a fed, both pointing fingers at each other. My aunties have no resources to hire lawyers and living in another country began a very slow and futile letter writing campaign that did little but create more questions than answers. I'll share one very important uh, little tidbit here in all of that letter of writing, uh, just so you can get an idea of what we were dealing with here. In 1976, Secretary of Internal Affairs in Canada sent a report to my auntie from the FBI, where they reported that after interviewing over 200 individuals in Cambridge, not one of them would discuss the death of Aunt Kane. Our family began to think that this was a lost cause and it was looking like something we were just going to have to accept. I recall later in 1980 reading details of my mother's death in a book written by Joanna Brand and thinking how odd it was that all these same members said they loved my sister, my mother like a sister, and yet not once did they ever call their sister's family to see how we were doing. There was nothing but silence. I began to think that their science was speaking volumes to me, and I wondered how an organization that claims they fight for human and native rights and the injustices brought upon by the oppressors that not once, at least by 1980, did I ever see any efforts made on their part to solve the great mystery of who murdered, murdered and they fit to a quash. Feeling hopeless and even more heartsick and trying not to think about the betrayal my mother suffered, we busied ourselves and lived our lives the best we could with a gaping hole in our lives where my mother should have been, hoping and praying that one day we would get some answers. In 1997, our answers were answered, our, our prayers were answered. 
not have called saying that a man by the name of Bob Brands called had put up a letter in our local newspaper asking for contact with the law and his daughter as a family. We discovered through phone conversations and email that his mother and my mother were first cousins. He had then went on to share that he discovered that there were several grand juries being held in my mother's uh, case and that uh, he had been researching the information that Paul and Nate had put out to the public and said that they had thought they had narrowed it down to three individuals who were responsible for the murder of Anne May. In 1999, Russell Means, along with Bob Graham's home and Ward Churchill, held a press conference in Denver, Colorado, where Russell exposed three individual responsible for the murder of Our Luke and John Roy Patton, or John Graham, Theda Nelson Cloud. He had said that these individuals acting on leadership's orders had taken her out to Waterloo where she was murdered. Years later, prior to Dickie Marshall's trial, I would have a phone conversation with Russell Means addressing what happened to be appeared to be a change in support where my mother's murder was concerned. When I questioned why he would support Marshall, who was charged with providing the help to the very same individuals he denounced and accused of being involved in my mother's murder a few short years before, he said the feds aren't interested in justice because the feds were not using his testimony for grand jury, and that he even knew who ordered my mother's murder, but could not reveal who that person was because he made an oath to them not to expose them as long as they were living. In 1999, I would receive my first letter from Leonard Pelton, where he says he loved my mother and wanted justice for her, and that as soon as he is free, he will campaign for her justice. That we, we should take care not to become FBI cops in the government's scheme to keep him in prison and to bring down me. Oh, and he says he never interrogated my mother, and that the feds were responsible for her death. So I responded saying that if he believed that it was the feds who put the bullet in my mother's skull, then he must have proof and details to share, and he would certainly have no problem helping us in exposing this information, regardless of where he was. He would write a year, he would write back a year later saying that he would not participate in incarcerating another gay man. And yes, that indeed he did interrogate my mother, but it was not enough. What he did not know was that I had already confirmed through at least three other sources that he did shove a gun into his sister's mouth. By 2001, I was in regular contact with Bob Grant's home and Paul Domain and working on two projects, the National Film Awards documentary, The Spirit of Man Day, and the CBC Fifth Estate documentary, Silence the Execution of Anna May. Information and confirmation began coming in at incredible speeds as more and more individuals felt safe to speak about their experiences as the truth began to be exposed that it was indeed any members who were, who were, who were suspect in murdering Anna May. I began publicly denouncing the use of my mother's image and quotes that were at the time plastered all over American Indian movement and Latin culture websites in their attempts at trying to take them to control thinking, I guess, that if they professed their friendship to her in the 11th hour, that would somehow excuse them in any complicity in her murder and for ignoring her for the last 27 years. In April of 2002, two events occurred that confirmed our worst fears and suspicions after 27 years that it was members of, her own, of my mother's own main group who had betrayed her taking her life. I received a phone call from our local club. In that phone call, he told us he had gotten caught up in my mother's kidnapping and that he had, had told him to drive my mother up to Rapid City with her and John Graham. He went through every detail, step by step, up to the point where they shot her mother and dumped her body on the side of the road. In late April, I was invited to go to San Francisco's 10th award ceremony, where Neelock Butler was to receive a humanitarian award in my mother's name for her lifetime of her humanitarian efforts. She was dying of cancer. And while we were there, a healing circle was created and a ceremony was performed. In that circle was Elon Butler, Dino Butler, John Trudeau, myself, sister, and my auntie. Just before the ceremony was closed, the woman officiating asked if there was any other concerns or issues anyone wanted to share, that now would be the time to ask for guidance and help. My auntie pulled herself up to her full, barely five foot height and said, Yeah, I want to know what happened to my sister. I was holding Dino's hand and began to shake uncontrollably. John Trudell bolted from the room and Neela stood there with him. I immediately turned to Dino on my right and said, Oh my God, is this true? You know these are the individuals involved in my mother's murder. And he began to cry. 
John left and came back to the room several minutes later, like a chicken with his head cut off, not quite sure which way to run, until finally he looked up grabbed both of them and took my aunt into an adjacent bathroom, where she confirmed that yes, indeed, these individuals were responsible for the kidnapping, interrogation, beating, rape, and murder of our mother. After experiencing that bizarre series of events, I thought, holy crap, these guys all know about this, and I wondered who else was lying. So I thought I would start calling being the leadership up. The first person I managed to get hold of was Bob Robinson, who confirmed several things with me during that conversation, including his knowledge that Leonard Felton had indeed shot the FBI, FBI agents, or at least one of them. In our initial phone call, I asked Bob, before we go any further, I need to ask you, did Leonard shoot those FBI agents? And he paused for a second, and he said, I can't answer that. I'm his first cousin. And I responded, uh, you just did. To which he then started laughing nervously and said I was young and I didn't understand that it was a war and I would never understand what they had all been through. It was self-defense. He then confirmed with me that indeed, Leonard Compton had shoved a gun into my mother's mouth and interrogated her for being successful and he was unsuccessful in finding that safe spot to stand, jumped right onto the Graham Defense Committee roster. Rob Blue had said when he yelled to me that his cousin was a fool and he deserved to be where he was and that he was stupid and that he would go down with the rest. He also shared an interesting email that I'll read from where he told me how he had gone to visit Russo. And these are Rob Robinson's words here, but I'll read. On November 4th, 1994, my son and companion accompanied me from Denver, Colorado, and Rapid City, South Dakota, to attend the last part of the game tribunal against Bunny and Clyde Belfort, whom we had brought evidence against for a long list of crimes against the Indian people and the American Indian movement. It was late when we arrived in Rapid City because of winter weather conditions, making the roads icy and hazardous. When we arrived, I called Bruce Delson to see and asked if he could put us up for the evening. Being an old friend, I knew he would be happy to have our company. I drove up to Dark Canyon to his home, which he had remodeled to enjoy the beautiful wooded splendor surrounding it. The following morning, while making ready to leave for the game tribunal at Mother Butler Center in Rapid City, Bruce, Bruce stopped me in the kitchen, and I was about to join my son and companion, who were waiting for me in the car. With consternation on his face, he blurted out, Bob, I'm still going to be indicted for the murder of Anna Van Quash. I looked at him for a moment to make sure he was serious. He was not just serious, he was scared. I knew that word, there was another federal grand jury underway. Bruce, what makes you believe the feds are going to indict you for the murder of Anna May? I asked. I went to the house, I went to the house where she was, where she was being held. Why did you do that? I asked. You know it was a mistake. We were always getting caught in situations for one reason or another. It was one of those occasions, Bruce answered. Well, Bruce, I have known the Maribel being for years. I don't think the feds are going to indict you for the killing of Anna May, I responded. Bob, this is what happened. Bruce, I don't want to hear any more of it. Okay? I do not believe they will indict you. You are a white attorney. They will want the Indians first. I left trouble by the box and you really didn't want to talk to me about all that shit. But I didn't want to know because I still wanted to believe that the FBI did it all. It was a few short months after his death that I heard from Robert Lewis. He had emailed me and said he was working on something that he could not share because of sensitivity and that I had to trust him and that it would blow the doors off the leadership's lies and bring my mother complete justice. In February of 2004, Ryan Anderson convicted of murder, the murder of Anna and picked away Quash. And December 2010, after almost seven years of appeals and delays, Gordon Adams convicted of felony murder of Anna and picked away Quash. Both have received those sentences. My mother's murderers and their conspirators and, no, and their co conspirators <laughs> very real injustices and twisted them to their agendas and hiding the facts that this was not the FBI, that it was not the FBI who murdered Anna May, but a fact named members acting on leadership orders. And that they have lied and deceived the public for over three decades to hide their complicity in her murder. <clears throat> so where does that leave us now? Three trials, 23 witnesses, one guilty plea to prove that it was in fact AIM members who took Anna May's life. And to this day, the leadership of AIM holds their sides and stares blankly, refusing to address my mother's murder and why they lied for 36 years. It is ironic, don't you think, that 
team leadership, Lemon Palantir, and their supporters. Only rebuttal to the information I shared with you today is to call me a cave, cartel, pro puppet, leader, visionary, exact labels they gave my mother before they executed her. And how perfect for their campaign of the bad jacket that their lies and deceit would leave no other recourse but for our family to rely on the very institution my mother protested so much in life to bring her to justice and death. I suppose moving us in with the feds creates a nice distraction and allows the other to make assumptions based on historical justices regarding our loyalty and intention. But I would encourage you to do a little investigation regarding my mother's death on your own and read the details of the trials and witness accounts of this era, and you will see a darker image that of betrayal of greed that surfaces. My loyalty is lied with one person, and one person only, my mother. I have no loyalties to the feds, loyalties to Amy, or any other individual in this room, or to my mother, bringing justice and value to her life, and accepting any other justice that occurred here in that era. Ray Robinson's widow and children deserve to repatriate his remains. It is their right, and if it is their wish, I will do everything in my power to make sure that happens. Through the discovery process and witness accounts, we now know that the very same individuals with knowledge of my mother's murder and cover up also know all kinds of information about Ray. I want to know why any leadership ever investigated the murder of Anna May. I want to know why they never contacted our family in 36 years. I want to know why they refuse to address the murder to this day. I want to know why they lied and continue to lie that it was the FBI who murdered Anna May. I want to know why. Though they say they don't know anything about the murder of Anna May, they are currently supporting her murderers. There is a lot of talk amongst the American Union movement and one encounter supports about healing. And Dennis Banks has even suggested we just get over this lateral violence and set our sights on healing and focusing our energies on the youth. Can you imagine? Just get over it? Imagine if someone came in here and said, just get over what happened in 1890. I guess you can hope. But I can assure Dennis and all of you listening today, until accountability is taken, Ownership and the death of all the individuals who lost their lives when we were in the 73, nothing will happen. There will be no healing. If they think for one minute, they can hold rallies and marches to protect five trans women with the blood of one of their sisters on their hands, they are more delusional than I thought. And I fear for our group that if this is the example of heroes they have to look up to, it is a sad testimony to the attitudes that allow this kind of injustice to continue in our communities today. Thank you for your time.